Welcome to He Did This To Me, the sports podcast from a father and son who happen to be mostly optimistic Knicks, Jets, and Mets fans. My name is Nick, a.k.a. Goody, and with me is my old man, a.k.a. the big guy, Noel. And just like his name, all we do is win. Let's get to the show. It's time to begin. All-star Jalen Brunson heard MVP chants in Wells Fargo Arena as the Knicks ended their four-game skid and improved to 34-22 and on the season with a victory over the Philadelphia 76ers, 110-96. Talk to me, big guy. How are we feeling about their Knicks after their first game out of the brick? I have to laugh when you um, bring up the um, MVP chance in opposing arenas. I know that has to be extremely frustrating to other um, fans. But, you know, the thing is, obviously, the Knicks have such a great fan base. And New York is such a huge city and has so many people that you have many expatriate New Yorkers around the country which obviously when the team is doing well, they're coming out of the woodwork. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to see. I, I, I'm enjoying it personally. But we're uh, not even just taking over, like, taking over, you know, Brooklyn Washington, is nothing. Brooklyn, yeah. even like, you know, some of these, I, who, who's another one that's like close by? Even when we go down to like Charlotte or Orlando, we usually take those over. But Philly, they're supposed to have such a strong fan base and they've had a team yeah. that's been perennially good here recently. But yeah. he's still go in there and take over that arena as well. Listen, we, we get, we, we're going to get chance in Miami for sure. Course, Cause always. there's so many New Yorkers down there. What I'm looking forward to is I want to see chance in like LA. <laughs> okay. and like a Lakers game. If we, Hey, listen, man, if we really make some noise going forward, you'll get them because again, you know, the city is just so populous that it just sends off many, uh, many New Yorkers. Anyway, uh, more importantly about their play, I mean, fantastic. I like what I see. I, you know, you got to like um, how the team stuck it out. And, you know, yeah, we went up by so much and, and then it, it went back against us. So you, you saw, you know, things go a little differently in the second half. But we came out playing so aggressively and so strong that I think we may have relaxed at halftime. And they amped it up because they were playing so badly um, that you had those two things you know, come together in the fourth, uh, third quarter. But then we got it back together, which is what good teams do. You know, uh, as we've spoken about many times, we've so often been on the other side of that where we're getting smashed. We come back, we're looking great. Oh, yeah. And we end up losing by 14. Um, you know, <laughs> we're not the, the, the coins flipped and we're on the other side of that. And I, I'm good with that. You know, as tough as it is to get to, I'm good with that. Yeah. It's hard to play 48 straight minutes of clean basketball. And those guys on the other side, as you always say, they're professionals too. And they came out in the third quarter. They ratcheted up the defense. They started playing really physical. The rest were letting them, you know, letting them beat up Brunson without any calls. You can see Brunson is getting very, very frustrated with the referees and people all around Nick's land feel his frustration. But, you know, Brunson had by his standards and off game. He's five of 18. A lot of these like floaters and close shots that he typically always hits were just bouncing around and not, you know, finding the inside of the net. And he was still able to have 21 points because he was 11 of 11 from the free throw line. And he chips in with 12 assists. So he always finds a way to get it done, even when he doesn't have his shot falling, but he was aided by some shot makers on his team, namely, and most notably, Boyan Bogdanovich, who comes out with 22 points. He's six of six from behind the arc. The guy's a straight up shot maker slash zone buster. I love when they tried running the zone. He flashes to the, to the free throw line, which I was screaming at the Knicks to do last year against Miami. And he's just one of those guys instinctually. He knows that that's what he's supposed to do. And he can make any shot from anywhere on the court. Loved what I saw from him. Glad to see him get a breakout game. Hopefully that helps him calm down and with our team now, with us being so deep, we have a team where any night could be a particular guy's night. And once we start to get some guys back, it's going to be a real challenge for Thibodeau to mix and match guys on a nightly basis, which last night I thought he did an exceptional job of, especially in that fourth quarter with the three-guard lineup, bringing in um, DiVincenzo with Brunson and bringing in your guy Deuce, who played some great defense on Maxi down the stretch, had a couple buckets as well. Yeah, no, Deuce. Um, I think Deuce is the kind of guy that will pay dividends, Nick. Um, you know, he he's just a tough ball player, and you know, he doesn't have to have a lot of shots, but he he can he will make um, noticeable differences for us in in clutch areas where we might be a little bit um, lesser. 
if not for him. And uh, I think he's a, I think he's a good young player. Um, I, I love, I like what I saw from Burks too. He seems to be settling in. We need to, we need to all take a collective, you know, deep breaths and just chill out and, and let these guys, Burks and Bogdanovich settle in and realize these guys are professionals. They're going to be what the back of their card says they are. And that's, you know, that's, that's good news, you know? So um, I think we're, I think we're in good shape going forward. Very excited to see what the rest of the season brings. And then hopefully, you know, when we get all our guys back and they start, you know, last night, what, um, Hartenstein only had, what, 11 minutes, which, you know, you got to bring him back very slowly, you know, go easy on that calf slash Achilles. And then, um, you know, when we start getting back uh, OG and um, our man Julius, sky's the limit. Yeah, I, I thought that, you know, last night was a good example of one of the things that's really going to be important for us going down the stretch and definitely when it gets to playoff time, which is Thibodeau, you know, playing the right people at the right time, depending on the situation, which is not an easy thing to do when you have this many guys. Look at a guy like Bogdanovich, who he's on fire. He's having a great game. But in the fourth quarter, when we really locked down the game and closed it out, he was on the bench. The matchups necessitated that we needed more guards. We needed somebody who could get out there. Shout to Johnny Bryant, who supposedly was in Tibbs' ear, saying we need to get Deuce in there and put him on Maxi. Maxi was invisible in the fourth quarter, and I thought there was a lot. He had a lot to do with that. And then mm -hmm. when he reinserts Divincenzo into the game, he comes in immediately, makes a three. Then next one he misses, but we get an offensive rebound, kick it back to him, and that one goes down. And that kind of gave us the breathing room that we needed. The game was pretty much closed out, I thought, when Brunson made that steal in the behind the back, and then mm -hmm. um, we got the layup, Deuce with the defensive pressure on that play as well. Sure, but sure. Um, the other guy who I thought yesterday just had a really good game was Josh Hart. Josh Hart, the thing about him is, I mean, he had 18 and 12. He only had three assists. You know, typically he has more than that. But the two things I noticed from him when he's pushing the ball up the floor and those first couple threes, whether or not he takes them with confidence, if he steps in and just shoots the ball, I know that during the break, he was working specifically on his shot and his jumper, especially his three-pointer. He, um, in the, the roommates podcast that he has with Brunson, he said mm -hmm. he made a comment in one of the episodes where he says, I'm a three and D player without the three. But he said, don't worry, Nick, Nick fans, I'm, I'm working on it. And then he posted pictures of him down in Miami during the break of him, you know, working on his jumper. So I think that's super important for him to get that confidence back. He's not going to shoot 51% like he did when he first got to the Knicks last year. But if we can get him in that, you know, mid to high 30s, and not down in the 20s, um, yeah. that totally changes everything because he's such a valuable player in so many ways. And another thing that I loved from Josh Hart yesterday was when he got the ticky-tack foul on Maxi, and he looked at the ref and pointed down to the other end and seemed to motion and say, well, what about our guy down on the other end getting hit just like that? He almost took a technical four Brunson right there. And I love right. that. I love that. Which Those is guys, what you got to do. Yeah, he's and and you know we need everybody that we've talked about this before. We need everybody to step up and kind of fight for Brunson, both physically in the game with the officials by you know imposing their will physically on the other team. We need everybody to kind of rally around him in that point because, like you said, guys are going to be all over him. They're going to be double teaming him, you know, mm -hmm. moving forward. And as a team, we need to strategically play better to alleviate that. We still don't ever set a pick in the backcourt. I don't get why, but. We also need to make sure that, you know, we're supporting him with, like I said, the officials and with the other players. And, you know, if they want to deliver some hard fouls, we got to deliver some hard fouls. But Josh Hart, I thought he played excellent last night. I think he's been trending up as of late. And, you know, it's more the more confidence he gets in that that that, that uh, jump shot, especially from three, you know, that's that that really takes us to a different level. Yeah, and especially with like like you're saying, this guy Bogey, when he is with him getting comfortable, if he's consistently getting you, you know, twelve to fifteen with the occasional breakout game, you know, that guy's really, really gonna hurt other teams, man. I mean, and when we swing it around to him, and like you say, he can shoot, but he can also put it on the floor, you know, he he's good in the post up game. He he's just like, you know, like you said, a professional, you know. And um I think he also does a good job of when he gets the ball, he knows what he wants to do with it. He's either going to make a move or he's going to shoot. He's going to do something. I um, think we're seeing, you know, what really is fantastic with the, the movement of the ball. And, you know, the ball not sticking as much. The only person that really sticks right now 
is um, Brunson, which is fine. It should stick with him. He's that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when Julius comes back, he'll have to make sure he moves in with the flow because I really feel like this team's about to take off, especially with the guys when they come back on moving the ball because no one wants to really, no one wants to really dribble much except Brunson. Right. And that's a good thing. There again, we're seeing the, the, the minus of RJ is a plus for the team. You know what I mean? We we don't need and listen. Julius dribbles a lot. We I wish he had dribbled a little less, but he paid such dividends. And if he's playing that bully ball in the paint, that's fine. We that's good. That's a good. That's a plus for us. We don't need a lot more dribbling on the perimeter. You know, that's exactly what it is. And um, RJ wanted to dribble on the perimeter. Bogdanovich don't dribble much on the perimeter. Julius, if he keeps that, you know, keeps his threes low like he has been, and stays in the paint. Hey, that, that's all good, man. It's all beautiful, you know? Yeah, I mean, Bogey, when it comes to economy of dribbles, he's about as good as that of any of anybody that you see. He, yeah. he really, like you said, I think that's a, a fantastic point. When the ball gets swung to him, he knows what he's going to do with it, and he either makes a quick pass or a quick move, and no matter where he is on the floor, he's a threat. That he, He's such a... I think something that is so interesting about him when it comes to his shot is I saw him one time uh, last night, the ball got kicked to him and he caught it kind of high and he just went straight up from that spot. Like he was a big man in the paint where you mm -hmm. teach him not to bring the ball down. He was just like, okay, there it is. But then I saw him the very next three that he had, which obviously he hit because he hit all of them. He, mm -hmm. caught, he had a little more time and he, you know, took his regular gather. So it's just like, okay, this guy is one of those guys that as long as he can finish like this, it doesn't matter how he gets there. It's got a good chance of going in. I think mm -hmm. that he will be able to alleviate some double teams from Brunson as they play more when guys are trying to get the ball out of his hands. And, you know, Alec Burks, the thing, like last night's the perfect example of how he can be effective, which is when you're not asking too much from him. You're going to have the occasional Alec Burke games, Alec Burke, you know, quarters where he just balls out and he's playing well. He hits a couple threes early. He gets in the game some with Deuce where he's the lead guard and Deuce is the, you know, off guard, which I think, you know, really more suits Deuce than being the one who's handling the rock. And then he ends up playing 13 minutes and we don't need him that much. That's exactly what I want from Alec Burks. I don't want to have to rely on 15 to 20 minutes of Alec Burks every night, but I want right. to be able to call on him when we need him. Um, yes. Your boy Ragu, one thing about him, he played well, but he's got to stop trying to dunk the ball. Lay the ball. Uh, <laughs> well, no, he can dunk the ball. Just go up with two hands and dunk oh, the ball. Oh, dad. He's he's like, he, he's had can't like, dunk the ball. We know I, that. I, but we've also seen – how many times have you seen him miss a dunk this He took this off year? too early. He took off like 10 inches too soon. He should have taken like another half step. Listen, man. Or just dunked off of both feet. Take care. He did that later on. He had to gather a little exactly. bit. Exactly. I know, but I've also seen him have at least five times this year where it's close to a posterization, but it's not. And what it ends up being is a missed dunk. And I would just like <laughs> you to just turn that ball over and put it off the glass and get me two points, Ragu. I like Ragu's the aggressiveness. Fine. I love Ragu. I love Ragu. Even though he didn't shoot the ball great last night, he still hit those two big clutch threes. I just think that he needs to, uh, I don't know, lay some of those balls up. Um, it's still but, not as bad as Obi. Obi. You know, it's speaking of uh, speaking of Obi, and we'll talk to, talk about him a little bit more when we talk about the All Star break in a little bit. But when you think of his brother, uh, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, his brother Big Jacob in the All Star. But when you think of Obi. Precious Achua is everything that we hoped Obi could become. Yeah. He's he, he's like that, you know, just – and he's not – obviously, Obi is a better – he's a better athlete than him. But Precious, maybe not as good of a three-point shooter, but he's a much more well-rounded offensive player. Obi – I feel, I, I feel Obi is a good three-point shooter, but I must admit, I feel better when Precious is shooting the three than I did with Obi. I, I don't know why, but I do. Well, he's not going to throw up as many, you know, UFOs. No air balls, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the thing is that, you know, he's not throwing up the, uh, the air balls. His three looks like a legitimate three. It hasn't right. gone in in a ton. Um, it but he has, you know, he, he, I think he made one last night. And, yeah. Um, yeah, overall, you know, love what Precious is doing. Again, 18 and 11. Seems like he gets 10 boards, you know, as soon as he steps on the court. Um, and Sims, like, like uh, Tibbs always says, he's got good feet. Got good feet. But Sims has a great ability to be able to switch out onto guards and then yeah. 
he almost does that better than he protects the rim at his size and his athletic ability, which which is which is hard to understand. But love what I'm seeing out of Sims in some spot minutes. And, you know, I I don't mind him gla having a glancing elbow across your boy Lowry's forehead and sending him oh, back to the Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. He's so absolutely annoying, Kyle not. Lowry. He's so Oh my annoying. god. I hate that guy. And he and, well, he just <laughs> He makes a lot of shots, man. Shots that you really wish he wouldn't make and shots that you think he's going to miss and they go in. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just not a fan. He's ne always been a thorn in our side. And I, he's one of those guys who was a thorn in our side, but I didn't want him on the team either. I don't, I don't, I don't want Kyle Lowry on my team. He's just that guy. I don't know. But um, I suppose if he was on the team, I'd learn to enjoy the way he plays. Um, but uh, also, again, with last night, you know, um, our man Tibbs did a very good job in, in his rotations and getting guys in. And, um, you know, I again, man, I just really feel like we are playing a certain way consistently. And that's something that's that's lacking, definitely has been lacking for the Knicks for many years and is lacking in this league, frankly, man. You, you don't see a consistent defensive effort and just all around effort on the court from teams like you do from the Knicks. That's because of Tibbs, and that's because Tibbs' top at least two players are extreme, you know, go-getter types in, in Brunson and, and Randall, you know, where they're going to play hard, you know, so everyone else must follow. And I think the, even the guys who follow now, they they raise the level too, you know. I mean, come on, man. This guy, Achua, this guy, DiVincenzo, Hart, um, come on. These guys are all, you know, bangers and hustlers, man, and that's what you need. Knicks culture. You know, that's the thing is that it, it's it, you can see that it's from top to bottom. We play the game a certain way and we bring in guys who are going to fall in line with that type of mindset and that type of play. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Tibbs did a great job last night with the rotations he did. Um, and, I, and I didn't even, even before the fourth quarter, I felt that way. There was times early on in the game where I saw like a lineup and I was like, hmm. You know, I, I okay. I haven't seen this before. This I like this. Some of that had to do with uh, Hartenstein clearly being on a minutes restriction, so you see a little bit more precious at the five. I don't know if Tibbs would be so willing to do that if he had an available Isaiah Hartenstein for his typical minutes. But that's another point: is these injuries it might end up being a blessing in disguise because we're able to see the potential and the ability of a guy like Precious and Tibbs is being forced to mix and match. And hopefully he's able to take some of that mixing and matching and be able to deploy that, you know, during specific times in the playoffs, depending on matchups, depending on what we're lacking at the moment. So hopefully this is um, something we can look back on. And when we're, we're in our playoffs and we're just coming at guys in waves and we can say, you know, that time when our guys were down, some guys, you know, stepped up into roles and Tibbs was able also to figure out some, you know, strengths and weaknesses and some of the best uh, different combinations. That, that's going to be have to be our difference this year. You know, like I, we were talking about last week and I was saying how, you know, Cleveland has raised their level a little bit, but we've raised our level. And I mean, and then some. OK, so I think that's really going to make a difference this year in the postseason, just how we're able to come at people and keep coming at people. You know, when guys are bringing in these second string guys that really aren't so great and they're going against Burks and Bogdanovich and, 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 um, and Deuce, you know, and Precious Achua. You know, and they're going hard because they want more minutes and they're going hard as if like they're playing now. Hey, man, that's not going to be easy for a lot of people to handle. And, you know, I, I really think it's going to be interesting. And then, you know, hey, we never know. It might get back all, old Mitch, too. I mean, it doesn't even seem like a might at this point unless there's some sort of crazy setback. He, You know, he's. He, he's supposed to be back in March, um, you know, exactly yeah. when in March. That's the thing that's still up in the air. Speaking of the injuries, we got updates on Randall and OG. OG says that he thinks he'll be back before the end of the season, which, the again, both with, both with him and Randall, the initial quotes that I saw alarmed me a lot more than when I actually went and watched the full interviews. He was asked specifically, do you think you'll be back by the end of the season? And he said, yeah. He didn't throw that out there like it was a timetable. Right. And so, you know, with him, it's kind of a wait and see. Once he gets cleared, everything's cleared up, then he'll have to get out there and get that elbow, make sure he can, you know, do all the things he needs to do on the floor. Randall, I mean, the amount of things that I saw online talking about surgery 
and I was so like, I, I was, I was busy at the time. So I was just able to look at the headline and I was like, Oh no. And then when I go back, I, when I opened up Twitter, my guy, NYK mentality, shout to him. He shouted us out on his page, NYK mentality one nine, um, on Twitter. He actually came out and he was like, listen, all I'm sorry. It's NYK mentality, 1985 on Twitter. Um, and yeah, he came out and he was like, yo, did anybody actually look at the clip? Because Nick's for clicks is a thing. You know, ESP, every every publication does it. Everybody on Twitter does it. If they can say something inflammatory about the Knicks, they know that it's going to get a lot of attention. What Julius said was, first of all, he joked about the fact that he's going to be back April 1st. I don't think you joke about that unless you feel like you're going to be back much earlier. In addition to that, he basically said, hey, you know, I'm just taking it day by day. But then Tibbs said they're not. Well, he can't. He, everything's going well. They haven't cleared him to practice yet. So that's the next step is him getting cleared to practice. Also, right. you never see a guy in the NBA who has an injury, rehabs it, doesn't have a, like a traumatic setback and ends up just getting surgery a month later. If he was going to get go under the knife, they felt like that's what they were going to do. They would have right. done that a long time ago. Now, is there a chance he ends up having to get surgery in the offseason? Sure, just like last season with Julius. He played yeah. through it, has to get surgery. He's a professional athlete. He's not you or I, who if we hurt our shoulder, we're going to, you know, doctor's probably going to say try to rehab it because we don't want to spend the money on surgery. We don't want to go through all these different things. And we can deal with, a you know, a 75% shoulder for the rest of our lives. If he has a chance to go in there and surgically repair it and get it back to 100% because he wants to play in the league for another, you know, eight, nine, ten years, then he's going to do that. But he's clearly trending on coming back this season. Season. And then today we got the video of his trainer doing a workout and Julius is in the background taking shots. And I mean, you know, he is obviously shooting with his left hand, not the right right one, which was the um, the shoulder. But he's bringing that arm up with it and shooting. He looks totally fine. They say he's been working out twice a day. I think Julius is on the fast track. I wouldn't be surprised if he's back like next week. You know that we're going to keep it close to the vest until that actual time comes. But yeah, a lot. I talked to you and, you know, you had just read the read the um, headlines. And once you actually break down and watch the whole thing, it's a much more optimistic timeline than it was, you know, kind of initially portrayed in the media. Yeah. And even though, you know, people like to hype stuff up again, I'll give credit to the Leon Rose regime. No leaks, no stupid garbage coming out. Not a lot of bullshit. Yeah, there's been some bullshit with this latest thing that you were just talking about. But honestly, Nick, if this had been past regimes with this type of injury, the, the, the speculation would have been rampant. It would have been bananas. I like the way that the Knicks just, they don't say anything. You know, that this thing comes out, Tibbs makes a statement because, you know, he was speaking to the press, which he has to do after games, and then they had a thing with Julius. But other than that, just don't say nothing. What is there to say? There's nothing to say. We'll be back ASAP. See you soon. You know, I mean, really, that's it. And um, that's the way an organization should be run. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Leon Rose deserves all the credit on on every avenue and, and, and every aspect, any way you can look at it. It's done a masterful job. We've talked about that ad nauseum. So I, I won't, uh, I won't bore the uh, consistent listeners with me just singing his praises again. Next up, we got Boston Saturday night, prime time at the garden. You know, they're very hard to beat at home. So it's nice that we are playing them in the garden. We're zero and three against them thus far. And I really want this game, man. You know, I, it sucks that we don't have our guys because I can't wait to see OG guard Tatum. But even without our guys, like Tibbs always says, we have enough to win. And right. we need to come out on Saturday and bring it and make a statement on what everybody thinks is the best team in the NBA. Listen, um, I, mean, I mean, obviously, if you're betting, you bet Boston to beat us on Saturday night. That said... Um, we definitely have a good shot. And basketball is that game, man. Basketball is a game that if you play smart, and if you, like, who was talking about it last night? It might have been Bill Pito or one of the guys at MSG. If you're moving the ball and you're, mo and you're moving your body, you, you get results in basketball. And if you consistently play basketball a particular way, you can play with anybody. And, you know, then we're going to need a couple big performances from some guys in the clutch, like, Brunson, like Bogdanovich, probably, to have a chance of pulling that game out. But, man, I tell you what, especially at the Garden, too, that Garden crowd starts getting pumped, which you know they will be against Boston if we're doing it big come fourth quarter. I mean, let's go, man. And, you know, all we need, all we need is for, you know, your man um, Jalen Brown to, you know, try to go left. 
And, and <laughs> anything's possible. No, honestly, one of the tougher things is going to be Drew Holiday. That guy, yeah. he's, a, he's an issue. You know, he, he is an issue. Uh, Brunson has to have uh, have to be running a tight game on Saturday night because, you know, Drew Holiday is going to be in that ass. Yeah, I mean, just a fantastic defender, has been his entire career and hasn't slowed down. He's only gotten better, so, so strong. And Boston, they shoot a ton of threes. They shoot over 40 a game. So you just got to hope you catch them on one of those nights where they're not shooting it at a high clip. And, mm. you know, we are making our jump shots and our threes. And it'll be interesting. I'm interested to see Precious to guarding Porzingis because one of the things that Porzingis does so well and how he kills the Knicks is on that pick and pop right at the top of the key and if you know you're not right up on him he shoots it right over you and he shoots it at a very good clip so I, I think that Precious actually might be able to bother him a little bit more even maybe than like I heart can Mitch it's one of the toughest matchups for Mitch he does not do well against Porzingis for a bunch of reasons he's not you know he's not great with the lateral quickness and he just naturally is not used to guarding that guys that far out so we'll see yeah. how that game plays out uh oh, Stephen a please stay away just just don't just just stay away stay away you know we haven't won a game that he's been at all season long thus far and you know even though he's starting oh, no, to no 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 he was at the miami game but he left when we came back and won. when we exactly exactly we uh, so that that's when we that's when the game back the comeback came is when he was out of the building. So Stephen A, watch him home. If you're a true Nick fan and you really want us to win, then you know you'll figure right. out a way not to be there. Um, up next, early next week, we got a back to back on Monday and Tuesday. Detroit on Monday. They've only won eight games all season. We better blow them out, and then we get New Orleans. Um, who's sitting at the same record as we are right now, 34 and 22. We play them on Tuesday, second out of a back-to-back. -back. That'll be a tough one. But, you know, I thought that I thought that last night was a good start. As we've talked about before, we need to go 17 and 10 to be able to get to that, um, that uh, 50 win mark. And I think that is the minimum of what we'll have to do to get up into that third seed, which is the big key to avoid being on Boston's side of the bracket. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I wanted to bring up something – Something I, I'm hearing with guys now. Okay, so I heard Stephen A. say, um, you know, Stephen A. is talking about now, like, um, you know, well, I expect us, you know, that we're, we're surely going to make the NBA um, the Eastern Conference Finals. So, and I, and I heard Kenny Smith say the same thing, you know. that. So now mm -hmm. that's almost like a setup, Nick, bro. You know, mm -hmm. like, I expect the Knicks to make the Eastern Conference Finals. They're good enough to make the Eastern Conference Finals. And if somehow we fall short... Oh, the Knicks suck. They've always sucked. I told you they suck. You know, you, sh you should have never believed in them. Blah, da, 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 da. And if we make it, then I told you all. I told you all. These Knicks, you know, I told you. Uh, so, I mean, just don't fall for the okie doke, folks. You know, I mean, that's all it is. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's just talking. But, I mean, I hope they make the Eastern Conference Finals. I think they can. You know? But it's just funny to me how sometimes these guys are so up and down with it. But... You know, listen, they have a right. They, they don't have to be uh, all in like I always am. You know, they, they, they can be a little more up and down. So it's cool. Stephen A's wavering sometimes bothers me. Kenny Smith and really both Kenny Smith and Shaq, they're just like disrespect and just, you know, the way they discard and, you know, sometimes just seem to be the absolute last to the party and the first when it comes to criticizing the Knicks. It drives me nuts sometimes, especially Kenny Smith. Uh, that guy, man, he, he, he frustrates me so much sometimes with his Nick commentary. And just in general, a lot of the stuff that Kenny Smith says, I'm just like, I know you're sitting there at the TNT studio. Like, are you watching these games? Remember, he said that when the Knicks play any of these teams, they have the second best player. on. They don't have the first best player on the court. And he talked about Orlando saying that neither Julius or Brunson is better than uh, Ben Carroll, which and Ben Carroll's very good. Don't get me wrong. Don't he's get me wrong. Good, he's a very, very good player. He's not, he's not as good as Brunson. He's not as good as Brunson. He's not as good as Julius. I don't know. Not as good as Julius. You're right. He's Julius, closer, man. but he's not as good as Julius. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, I, I hope Nick fans now are starting to appreciate Julius a little bit more. Supposedly, Julius has been um, watching a whole lot of films, spending a lot of time with Tibbs. So hopefully he goes even another level jump as far as his, you know, cerebral game, because we know that he spent a lot of time doing that this last offseason when he was recovering from an injury. So maybe him doing that even a little bit more and we get to see him taking it up even another notch when just before he got hurt, he was playing the best ball of his career. In my opinion, just a total floor game, being very patient, 
you know, really looking for guys, setting guys up and, you know, like playing that bully ball. One thing that makes me a little bit nervous about Julius is that his biggest move is taking that right shoulder and running it mm. into people, which mm. with the shoulder injury, it shouldn't be so much of him like running it into another person. And then they like that making it pop out. If that's the case, then it's in a real, it's in a real, real bad spot. Yeah. It's more yeah. about like when it gets bent in awkward ways and things like that. So, you know, Julius is going to do everything he can to get on the floor. And, you know, once he's on the floor, he's a warrior. He's going to play like an absolute battering ram. And, you know, I just can't wait to see all of these guys get back together I don't know what's going on with OG and the elbow, but from what everybody says, as far as the typical situation with that injury is once he gets cleared by doctors, so let's spend a little bit of time and probably go through, through some pain and discomfort, kind of just getting it back right, and then he should be good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little um, WD-40 in the joints, and he should be fine. New York Mets got unfortunate news this week. Our ace, our rookie of the year, runner-up last year, um, Cy Young runner up in the National League last year, Kodai Senga. First, he was saying he had an arm fatigue. Now it's a shoulder strain, it's a capsule issue. There is no timetable being set. As we know with pitchers, he's going to have to get to the point where they start letting him pitch again, and then he's going to have to ramp up, which who knows how long that's going to take. I was talking to my guy, CPNY. Um, shout to CPNY. You can catch he and I doing the post games on True Knicks Talk. And he's really locked in with the Mets. And he said, I think it's minimum two months before we'll be able to see anything. Really, really tough news as we start off our ace going down. The starting pitching rotation already looking a little bit thin. And now we got to deal with Kodai missing possibly at least two months, maybe even more. It's going to it's a disaster. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Senga, man, you know, Ghost Fork, you know. Ain't gonna be seeing that too much. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I, I I don't think this will, you know, turn around till at least June. Um, we're 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 in trouble. You know, there's no other way to look at it. We're in trouble. This is gonna be a tough season. And, you know, listen, man, it's gonna be a tough season. You know, the best thing they can do is whatever's happening, signed sign our man uh, Pete, polar bear. And just make everybody happy that way. Honestly, I mean, at some point in the season, you may need to do that just to just to be positive PR wise. I don't know. Just get that guy in the fold, lock him up, and then you know you, you'll cool my jets for the rest of the season. I if you tell me that Pete's here for the long haul, I'll be maybe upset this season. But I'm willing to make a deal with the devil that I will not get too upset this season if Pete's signed for long. I'm not punting on the whole season just yet. Um, you know, in baseball, quite often when you go out and you sign everybody, it you doesn't turn out well. We saw that last year. And so sometimes you get a, you know, a couple young guys, some scrappy guys, you know, somebody like Sean Manea steps up with his, you know, new slider that he has. And we're able to, you know, hold down the fort until Kodai gets back and maybe make a move at the deadline. Who knows? Did you watch the clip that I sent you of Howie Rose <laughs> Um, talking to Steve Cohen about Pete Alonso. I did not see that. No, no, I must have missed that. What did he say? Oh, it was very good because what he said was, listen, we want to have this guy back. We know he wants to come back. And I realize how Mets fans feel about this. So I hope he goes out this year, hits 55 home runs, and makes it as hard on me as possible to ever let him get away. But, you know, he, he, I, the thing I like about him is, is that he's an actual fan. So he knows right. how those actual right. fans feel. And, you know, right. he, he, he realizes that with this guy being with Boris, he's going to test free agency. He's going to get the most money. But also, I saw an interview from Pete the other day, and he was talking about how excited he was for opening day to be in City Field. Because he, uh, wildly to me, I thought this, I couldn't believe this, he's, he hasn't experienced that yet. All of his opening days that wow. he's played in have been on the road. So I, I think Pete is going to bring that that boyhood, joyous attitude that he always does. And mm -hmm. hopefully that can propel us. I think that the biggest key to this season is Marte. And that's been the yeah. biggest key over the last couple seasons. You go back to two seasons ago where we are winning the division the entire year, running away from it, when the Braves started to come back and eventually overtook us, was when Marte got hurt. Last right. year, Marte barely plays at all, and we saw how that went. He went and played in the DR this summer. He said he wants to play at least, you know, 78 games, I mean, 178 games this year. And when he's in there, 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 158. He said so. I don't oh. know. Whatever. He said he wants to play most of the season. Who cares what the number is? But uh, <laughs> 178 because he wants to play in the playoffs, too. That, well, I thought that's what you were saying. That's <laughs> the number through the World Series or something. No, nah, I'm just an idiot. But um, he, uh, the thing about Marte is, is that he's so solid on so many different places in the field. He's a great base runner. He is great in the field. He's got a strong arm, and he hits for average, and he's got a little bit of pop. I think that whether or not our offense is – Average to above average is going to have to do with how many games he plays. Yeah, no, he's a big piece, man. And, um, you know, got to love Starling when he's right, you know, makes a big difference for us. He's one of the, he's a, a big part of the engine for the Mets. And, um, I mean, look, man, it, it's look, starting to look like we're going to need a lot of offense. You know, we're going to need a decent amount of average runs per game because, you know, I think we're going to be giving up at least four or five runs a game. So, you know, we got to bring it and we got to make it happen. Um, a little concerned, Nick, um, and and you pay more attention to this sort of thing at this time of year than I do. But um, what's the DH situation all about? Vientos and what's the other? Some, I, 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 what's the other guy? Stewart, DJ Stewart. I, what happened to JD Martinez? We can't get that guy. Nobody's nobody signed that guy. I mean, he's he's. I, am I wrong? Isn't that guy like, like definitely better than either of the two people I just mentioned? Yes, I would say that he is better. Um, but why we, you know, didn't go after him, what type of money he's asking for, uh, you know, clearly there's, you know, no, nobody's been able to sign him. So right. I don't know exactly what that deal is. Um, I just think we need more talent at the DH position. I'm sorry. Mark Vientos hitting 258 or 267 <laughs> is not knocking me out of my seat. And, you know, either of those guys, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. The other guy, DJ Stewart. We had a couple of moments last year. He's a bit of a chunky sort, and they, you know, he's a tough guy. He's no, he's no, he's no, um, he's no. Who's my man? The battery, the barrel chest guy from last year. Bogle, you, Bogle, Bogle, Bogle. Bogle. Oh come on! I don't, even, I don't want to hear that guy's name. That guy. Come on, man. He's, it's such an embarrassment that we had that we were trotting him out there last year as an MLB player. Like, I mean, he's just such a joke. Uh, come on, Good. man. He, he he's a great mascot, but he he's not an MLB player on any team that's trying to do anything in October. Just not watching him, watching him try to leg out a double was a leg out. Please, <laughs> there was a chicken oh leg. God. There was a chicken leg hanging out of his pocket as he was trying. Right, to right, right, right. Legs. Well, there should have been one, maybe five feet in front. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, my gosh, that guy. Uh, he seemed like a very nice guy, but who cares? But come on, get him out. He's got to go. I'm so glad he's gone. I'm I so said at the end of last season that if we start this season when Vogie is still on the roster, that I'm boycotting the season. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Vogie. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Last week, we had the NBA All-Star Game. It was very underwhelming. By almost all accounts, the Ionescu versus Steph Curry three-point competition was probably the best. Not even probably. That was the best part of the All-Star weekend from my yes. point of view. Um, great to see her shoot from the NBA range and show that, you know, she can compete with any of the guys. She would have gotten out of the first round um, in the uh, had she played. It'd be interesting to see the different iterations of that competition that spawn from this moving forward. But um, we'll talk about the dunk contest first. Your man Toppin got straight up hosed. That through the yeah. legs 360 definitely should have gotten way better scores. Jalen Brown, I don't know who he paid off out of the judges or what was going on, but he was getting scores on just like normal, regular ducks. He did the deep round dunk, but he waited till he dunked and then put his hand there. You know, and just the fact that he dunked with his left hand, I just don't understand. They, first of all, they have to do something about the judges. They can't just, like, pick some NBA legend from this city who does who who, who, who I've never heard of. And if, 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 and if I haven't heard of him, then, you know, he's very obscure. And it's just so inconsistent with the judging. And we really got to figure out a way to inject life into the entire weekend. But focusing specifically on the dunk contest, and I've heard a lot of people in the media saying this recently, you know that I've been saying this for years. I blame it all on LeBron. 
I blame it all on LeBron because he was the first guy who was a super high flyer, great player, who decided to opt out. And all of these guys that you see that are young now that watch and emulate LeBron, they're all opting out and they're not doing it. It's become not as cool. Michael did it three times. Kobe did it at least once. All these guys did it. And then LeBron steps out. We have to figure out a way. If I'm the NBA, I'm doing everything I possibly can. Anthony Edwards, John Morant, I need both of you in the dunk contest next year. Sure. If I'm Adam Silver, I'm talking to them about that right now and saying, what do we got to do to make that happen? No doubt. Um, you need those guys in there. You need guys to just start taking the weekend seriously. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's that guys will claim like, oh, if I play too serious or whatever, I might get hurt and blah, blah. Stop. Stop Bullshit. that. You're, you're athletes. You know, come on, man. This is this is part of what you do. And it's also bullshit to say that the kids enjoy because of so much scoring. Kids will enjoy scoring in a competitive game. That's what they'll enjoy. Okay? And um, the dunk contest, I thought Baby Top, I did think he got burned. Um, I did like that one between the legs dunk. I did think, though, that that kid, Matt McClung, did a great job once again this year. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I, Jalen Brown's dunks were just straight up corny. I'm sorry. They were corny. But McClung and, can't even make it in the league, Dad. That's, that's, how yeah, sad I know. The, that's how sad the dunk contest is now. Right. That we got to right. go sure. grab guys from the G League to be able to, you know, make it somewhat exciting. Yeah, I have a hard time also understanding how McClung can't even make it. I, I think he's better than some 11th men in the league, but that's just me. Um, you know, I was watching him the night before in like the Rising Stars game, but it just goes to show you, Nick, that when you put these guys in the G League or you put them in a Rising Stars game and all that, and they can, they can do all this and that, when they get into a real game, it's not the same, man. I mean, like we spoke about with McBride or with Baby Top when they go down to the G League. They're like 35 a game minimum. <laughs> You know, these guys are incredible. They come into the NBA and they're, they're scared to shoot, you know, so half the time, half the time. So, but anyway, the, 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 um, the all-star game, they've got to figure out something to make it more competitive. I'm not exactly sure what they do there, but, you know, they have to do something because right now, I, I think even the NFL did a better job in saying, okay, let's get away from the whole suit up for a Pro Bowl thing. Let's play a little flag football. And like the other night when I was watching that NFL thing, um, and they're playing like dodgeball and doing all these skills things, that was fun. You know, that's fun. It's not football, but it's fun. I'm not saying basketball needs to do the equivalent, but they need to do something because what it, they have is not working. Yeah, the skills competition was especially bad. I mean, it's just, I just thought everything. What do you mean, so for, the, for basketball? Basketball this year, yeah. But in even football, that, you know, in the football, football when they were doing stuff, was fun. Right, because it's just fun, you know, like, well, right. I, yeah, know, the skills competition was corny. It was, it was corny. Um, yeah. You know, I got really tired of all the Pacers by the end of the weekend. It just, uh, I'm just tired. You know, I just don't like the Pacers in general. But yeah, yeah. All, their, all their whole act and. Eh, I could just, just, I could just that, it just wasn't exciting or interesting. It wasn't care. exciting, but the question is, how do we fix it? Okay, I so don't. I don't know exactly, but a couple ideas I got, maybe in like a three-on-three -three tournament, you get like a little three-on-three -three tournament, or you play like a one-on-one -on -one tournament, and it's it's you take like the top like top like ten guys, you do a one-on-one -on -one tournament, but you make it something where it's like you know like a game to five, you know, a game like that's like a real game to five. Yeah, one to twos. but and, you know, a one-on-one -on -one tournament, Nick. Now, there's where you could get hurt because guys are going to get uber competitive with that. It's one on one. Guys are going to get super competitive with yeah, that. Yeah, but you know what? These guys are playing one on one against each other after practice. We always hear stories right. about some of these. No, where, nobody, where there's no camera and no, nobody cares about who wins or loses and they're just laughing and messing around. No, I see. Be in front of millions? Okay. I don't think. I'd love guys... to see it. Let's go. I, listen, I'd love to see it. Let's get some competition. Let's get these guys actually give, caring and giving a fuck. And I'm sorry, but I watch clips of them in the summer playing in the Drew League or playing at the Rucker League, and they're playing harder than they play in the All-Star game. It's just True. getting to a point where it's not, it's, it's not that it's not fun to watch. It's almost like it, 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 it offends me to watch the basketball be played that way. Um, right. So I just really think they got to figure out something to do to get it more exciting. One tidbit that I thought was interesting, I saw that both Donovan Mitchell and LeBron missed the first game after the All-Star break. Yo, I'm glad they're not Knicks because if my guy goes and plays in the All-Star game and then the first game back, he has to miss, the, miss that regular season game, I'm very, very annoyed because if you didn't hurt something or pull something and maybe you just need a little rest, then guess what? Don't play in the game. What, what's more... 
I mean, listen, I'm hearing, I'm hearing there's a little oil on the tarmac on the walk to the p- private jet. <laughs> hey, man, whatever the case is, I'm going to need those guys to play a little better. I thought that Brunson represented himself well in the three point contest. He obviously wasn't able to move on to the second round, but it wasn't like he just went out there and had some put up some right. shit score. He had 24. He needed 26. He needed to hit that last shot. Um, and then in the all-star game, he played pretty well. First half, not so, but, you know, didn't really do too much. Second half, he was able to get in there, get some buckets, got 12 points, got a good experience. And, you know, maybe in a couple of years, it'll be him pulling up from half court instead of Dame Dalla and getting the MVP. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't see him in the second half because I didn't watch the second half of the game. <laughs> I'd had enough. So um, one of our one of our favorite guys to talk about, Jordan Poole. He was benched. <laughs> Yo, my guy got benched for the first game out of the break. Um, And he had some interesting quotes. When asked about it, he said, if there's any common sense with the situation, you know how how I feel, Poole said. But I'm just going to come out and do what I can do to help the team keep it moving. So clearly he is not happy and does not agree with the benching. Poole in the month of February thus far is averaging 10.3 points, 5.7 assists, four rebounds, and he's shooting 29% from the field and 25% from behind the arc. This guy's career seems to just be absolutely sinking like a stone since he has been shipped out of Golden State. Oh, and by the way, in the next four years, he makes 27, 21, 31, 27, 29, 31, and $34 million, respectively. That's a hard piece, that contract. I mean, he... Um... <laughs> You know, he's one of those guys, man, that he was he did very well being on that team with those other guys on that team. Mm -hmm. It it allowed him a lot more freedom to do what he does and do it well. Uh, Being put in a situation where he's more of a focal point and where other teams can focus on him and defend him. That is not good for him. Um, And, you know, I mean, beyond that, as we've spoken about before. He doesn't seem like the most serious of individuals. So I, I don't know if that really um, works well for him, you know, and trying to, because clearly, you know, coming to, to Washington, I'm not sure if he realized it, but getting that bigger contract and being put in that situation, he needed to step his game up. He didn't need to just keep being Jordan Poole. He needed to be Jordan Poole plus, And he's actually become Jordan Poole minus. He needed to step his game up as far as just like his level of play, but he also needed to step up his level of maturity and his ability to be a leader. And, you know, we've seen this before. Look at guys like Brunson. Look at guys like Julius. They came to a team where all of a sudden things were at more as was asked of them and they were up to the task and they met it and, you know, exceeded it. And the team followed. He's the type of guy where you take a step back and you look at it if you're Washington and you say, you know, we got to figure a way to get out of this just because we can't have our young guys and the guys playing on our team looking at him as an example. And, you know, he carries himself, like I've said before, like he's a 14 year old on the floor. He's not a serious individual. And we're seeing now that it's not just people like you and I who see this, but his own coach is now saying, Hey, you, we need to reevaluate. You need to come sit next to me and, you know, we can reduce your role though. His minutes, I mean, he did play 30 minutes in the game, so it's not like his minutes have been greatly reduced, but I think that the, the, the word is out around the league that this guy is not what anybody thought he was, especially himself. And when you put him in a position where you need him to be a leader on your team, you know, you, you got a boat with no captain. Yeah, no, a rudderless ship to be sure. And, um, yeah, it's not looking good for him or them. Um, you know, I, I you know, Nick, I, I sit back sometimes and I see uh, moves that these other teams make and you see the results of them after a couple of years. And you have to be thankful that at least your team is making, like, sober moves. You know, some of these moves are just like, what are you doing? You're just literally grasping at straws and it doesn't work out well. Isaiah Thomas would have traded for Jordan Poole at the deadline this year. A hundred percent. Isaiah Thomas, I, you know, listen, our big man situation would have been a disaster right now. You know it would have been. I mean, we'd be paying somebody $50 million a year who played like 40 games a year. We'd be playing like DeMarcus Cousins or some shit like that. A hundred percent. Or De- DeAndre Jordan. Or, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. We'd be paying him, you know, $43 million and like trying to get him to walk away with like a Bobby Bonilla deal or something. <laughs> 
Catch us every week on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. Please follow, like, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that notification button on all platforms. Really appreciate all the love. We try to stay as current as possible. So episodes will typically drop on Thursdays or Fridays, depending on the Knicks schedule. You can also catch me on True Knicks Talk Post Game Live throughout the second half of the season with my guy, CPNY, link in bio. And you can find us on all socials at he underscore did this to me. Love you, big guy. Love you, kid.